And Jeff Whiteback is uh, here with us this morning. Jeff uh, took over as the uh, administrator for the township uh, four, five, six weeks ago. About a month. Okay, yeah, about a month ago. Let me hear him first. I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we appreciate their, uh, them being here and supportive. Uh, David Denny and those who hired me uh, two and a half years ago, uh, Susan Bennett and uh, Jen Conan, the first thing they said was, we need to bring the business community together with nonprofits, with the uh, school district, with the township, and to bring it to a cohesive group. Um, I feel like we're moving that direction. Uh, there's a lot of synergies that are taking place between uh, all of these organizations. Uh, uh, Dale Beck and Gail Nolte are here with Side by Side. They formed a group called Colerain Hope, helping our people every day. And uh, we're meeting on a regular basis. We were at the, the library this past week looking at grant resources, uh, helping nonprofits to uh, come together and share resources. And um, it can't happen without uh, these folks here and the staffs that they have. So um, we're gonna start with Marnie first. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, we know that you have a tool card. Was that what was in the uh, in the package? Yeah. So good morning, everyone. I'm Marnie. I serve as assistant superintendent at Butler Tech. Um, on your tables, there's just a sticker um, on your little mints after breakfast in case you need them. But um, the sticker says Career Connect, and it's careerconnectbutlertech.org. And what that does for you, if you're interested in becoming involved with Butler Tech, you can post a job for free, you can find a job for free, you can become a business partner. Once you fill out um, the application, it's like, uh, it's not really an application questionnaire, it's like 10 questions on how you wanna be involved, that comes directly to me and then I contact you and I um, fit your needs on how you want to utilize students. For those of you that um, are aware, we serve 18,000 students. Wow. Uh, and we also, am I going into that? Is that working? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we serve 18,000 students. The majority of that are high school age, but we also have um, adult education centers. So if you want to become a business partner, if you're looking for a job or you want to post a job for free, just get on that Career Connect. Um, one of the business partnerships I want to tell you about is last Thursday, we had Procter & Gamble come to Colerain, Colerain and Northwest High School, um, and we met with 70 of your students. They want to hire students right out of high school, um, and they're also doing summer internships. Is everyone sitting down? Make sure you're sitting down. Summer internships at P&G for $26 an hour. Wow. And so when the students that we met with, um, and it's not well Tech students, it's any student at Colerain or Northwest that's interested, we gave them notebooks with a QR code, but if your person that you might know is did not go, it's fine. The counselors have that QR code. <coughs> they can sign up for a mentorship, and P&G will mentor them to get them into summer internships, and if they love it, they can apply for a job at PNG. So please know that we are here for you, not just for students to take Butler Tech classes, which is great, but it's for any student to benefit um, all of you as they go on their journey. You were also recently awarded fifteen million dollars. Um, I was. No. <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> we know better. You have to split up with a job. Yeah. And William was still at work today. And William too. So, yes. Uh, and lots of others. But yeah. uh, tell us about the grant. Uh, how it's going to be used and the planning uh, around that. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm so happy. Jim Denzel always shows up. Um, he's a board member here, and he's also a board member for Butler Tech. He's been a part of this mission since the beginning. Since we have a waiting list, and you guys can imagine, if a student wants to go to a campus, we have a waiting list. We have a lottery right now, so you put your number um, on a ball. If it gets picked, you get to come to the campus. But imagine if you're a child that really wants to come, and your number didn't get picked. Like, we lose sleep over that. So we are committed to reaching the greatest number of students. So we went after um, the commissioners had some money for COVID relief. We went after that. We did earn $15 million um, 
from the commissioners, which we went after about 22. And so we're happy to say we're about 22 um, right now using other resources that we have. We are building two new sites, and this is why I'm really excited to be here because it involves every one of you if you're interested. We're building a site in Hamilton as well as Middletown because with the grant money, that was the stipulation. But all of you can get involved. Additive manufacturing as well as um, in Ho at Hook Field in Middletown will be an aviation education center. So the way this works is we're bringing government, education, and businesses together. If you were to come to me, Dave, I don't know if you have, happen to be in a metal business. <laughs> we'll talk. <laughs> you were to come to me and say, I would like a space in that additive manufacturing center so I can bring in real world problems. We are going to train students for a couple of years in the mechatronics, which is the engineering, the welding, the IT bring those students in at an older age so they can work in these two centers with businesses solving real world problems. And the businesses can work together, such as TechSol, if you know who they are out in Eco, and 80 Acres, they help each other because 80 Acres has a lot of robots and they need the robots <coughs> to talk. And David Linger from TechSol patent that. And so they're gonna be in the same space as P&G is going to be there. We got um, grant money from Google, they gave us a quarter of a million dollars for IT for these spaces. So if you're a company that says, I want to meet these young people early, and I want to drive the curriculum. We have a meeting January 11th with any business partner that wants to drive the curriculum to say, this is what we need, and I want a space. We're not asking you to pay for the space. We just want you to be in that space and bring what you need to solve business problems and then use our students to be trained, and then you have first crack at what comes out of these centers. We'll also be doing adult ed there for people in the community um, to get certifications. So two new spaces um, coming very soon. We have about two years to build them, but if you want to be involved, please reach out. Wow. <laughs> I'm sure each of you has questions for Marty and for each of the individuals here. Um, Write your question down real quick. Um, remember that uh, that uh, Marty's going to be here to answer those questions. I'm going to move over to uh, Daryl here, but I do want to put a plug in for these Butler Tech students. I went to 12 of their classes uh, at Northwest, yeah, uh, at Northwest High School and at uh, Colerain. Um, some really top-notch kids uh, involved, and we as the Chamber of Commerce were one of uh, several sponsors of a uh, race car that raced out at uh, Lawrenceburg. Yeah. Um, these kids built this car from scratch um, and put it on the racetrack. It was an amazing evening, and uh, I, I just can't say enough about the, the programs of Butler Tech and, and their partnership with Northwest Schools. Um, uh, Daryl, you and I have talked several times. Um, this is a critical year for uh, a bond issue and levy that's, uh, that's on the ballot. Can you share with uh, the group here, why it's important for the, uh, the community, for the students, and also why it's important right now, why that's important. Thank you, and thank you to Marty and the partnership with Upper Tech. Our students have amazing opportunities with our teachers in our schools and in collaboration with Upper Tech, and we're proud of the partnership because as a uh, partner with Butler Tech, we have on-site programs as well as the ones at Butler Tech. So um, it's a very robust partnership that gives our students a lot of opportunities. With the bond issue that is on the ballot in November, there's a lot of um, reasons why now is the right time. One is schools, communities, and businesses are inextricably linked together, and the ability for us to rise is rising together. And our success and your success are together. The students that come out of our tech, come out of our high schools and go right into your businesses are an example of the partnership that we've been able to build. We have buildings that are approaching and turning 100 years old. Cornell will be 100 next year. Northwest High School is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. And so a lot of our buildings have needs that need to be addressed from a facility standpoint. From an economic standpoint, <clears throat> buildings have a certain lifespan. Typically, a school building lasts around 50 years. 
the state of Ohio has assessed all of our buildings and all of them, except for the three new ones, PRE, Taylor, and Struble, and Montfort Heights, don't meet the state standard for renovation. They actually exceed the renovation cost and it's more cost effective to replace the rest of our buildings. We currently have from our pre-K through 12, students who are in very different educational experiences. And we wanna make sure that all of our kids have access to the same kind of education. Currently, our buildings have a lot of needs. We have $40 million in deferred maintenance. That is maintenance that our buildings need right now that we have not been able to address. That does not include coring and coring mills simply because of the age of those buildings. <coughs> and so as a district, we wanna make sure that we can address the long-term facility needs in a way that is economically feasible and sustainable. And so as a district, we've looked at phasing our master facility plan into three phases. Phase one was the three new elementaries. With that, we have partnered with the state of Ohio through one of their programs. It's the Extended um, Learning Part Local Partnership Program. This allows us to earn credits for the buildings that we are building now that will be used at a later time when we go into a partnership with the state for a co-funded project. The state is working through every district in the state of Ohio based on their um, economic level, and they are going one district at a time, paying a percentage of a cost to rebuild buildings throughout the state of Ohio. We are currently working toward having the state co-fund our project. That will probably happen in the next five years or so. So as we get to that level, we want to maximize the amount of funds up to that point. So phase one was our three elementaries. We earned about $16 million in credits in that phase. With phase two, phase two rebuilds our entire pre-K-8 model to be consistent and to be equitable. So we would have in phase two, a new Houston elementary, a <coughs> preschool. We would have a new Corrine elementary, a renovated Montfort Heights Elementary, and we would have two new middle schools to replace the current three that we have. That phase, when we build that, we will earn about 30 to 40 million in additional credits from that phase. That will then go into phase three, which will be our high school phase. The high school phase would be co-funded with the state of Ohio, where they will actually pay about 25% of the total cost of that project. And we would be able to cash in the credits we've built up to that point. So that makes it the most cost-effective way for us to address all of our building needs now and in the future, and use those state resources to offset that so that it's less of an impact on the community. We also have right now a bond issue that is on the books for the bond that built Montford Heights in 1997. That bond was passed initially at 1.15 mills, and that gets paid off and rolls off of the books in December. So if the levy passes in November, when that rolls on in January, it's 4.98 mills, it will coincide with the other one rolling off. So the real seal to a homeowner will be less than four mills for the new elementary, the renovated Montford Heights, two new middle schools, and a new preschool. So we believe that it's the right time for a lot of reasons to address all of our building needs. We also want to make sure that we can maximize that reimbursement from the state. And we have a lot of needs that need to be addressed right now. Roofs, building envelopes, different heating, air conditioning, windows. If we replace anything now, we lose that credit when we build. So we want to make sure that we can get the credit and not pay 200%, for example, if a roof goes out and we have to replace that at Corrine L. We would pay 100% of that roof now. We would pay 100% <coughs> of the roof for the new elementary. And then we pay 200% for a roof on a building as opposed to replacing that building now, getting that credit and paying 75% for that roof. So we wanna make sure that we are mindful of the taxpayer's dollars use that in the most cost-effective manner and make sure that this is the most cost-effective way to rebuild our district. I don't know whether you've noticed or not, but uh, he did that without notes. <laughs> <laughs>
Daryl lives this every day, and uh, again, he and I talked about this. Um, as a business, from a business perspective, you have to make choices, uh, and we're not necessarily in the business uh, uh, for the business. We're talking about the long-term success of kids today. Um, we're talking about 20 years from now, not just uh, what's going on today. But I did want to ask, because uh, again, we talked about the report card. Um, you're very proud of uh, what your kids are achieving. Just share with the group um, what that means. All right, I'll try to be less long-winded on this one. But I get really passionate about this stuff. Um, our kids are doing amazing, and our staff um, is getting a lot of accolades. The state puts out a report card for schools um, every year, so the schools get a local report card and the district gets a summative report card. And we haven't had a report card for a couple of years because of the pandemic. And so the report card that was just issued is based on last year's data. And if you remember last year, and I know a lot of us are trying to forget last year, it was still a lot of contact tracing, quarantines, social distancing, and we had a lot of kids out of school, a lot of staff out of school because of those mandates. And so the report card we have now um, is a reflection of what our staff was able to get done through all of those challenges that we faced last year. And we have a graduation rate that is over 93% as a district. We are a four star for graduation. We are a four star for gap closing. It's a five, a five star model. Anything three or above is meeting or exceeding expectation. We have um, a three star in our um, progress component, which means our students are making progress and they're making more than what the state was expecting to make in a year. And we have, based on the pandemic, a lot of work to do to build back up to where we were and exceed our previous expectations. And coming out of the pandemic, our report card is about where it was before. And so this is our new baseline. And this allows us to continue to move forward and to increase year over year over year. Um, so we have some areas that we're focusing on around early literacy. And we have a program with our elementary teachers where they're, we're using some of our federal ESSER money to fund some professional development for them. That's basically a graduate level course on the science of teaching reading so that we are creating systems and structures where success is by design, not by accident. And all of our students have access to a caring adult who knows them by name, by story, by strength, and by need, and can support them to their highest possible level of achievement. So we've got a lot of great things going on in the district. Our report card is showing some signs of improvement, some areas of success, and we are systemically building additional success year over year over year. And so we're excited that with our report card, our achievement, our staff, our students and our families that we'll be able to also have the bond issue where the new schools will be also a reflection of that achievement as well. Again, I feel blessed to be able to have the cell phone numbers for these three individuals and, and others within their organization. Um, they're willing to meet me for breakfast to uh, sit down and talk about the challenges associated with uh, their respective organizations. Um, uh, Jeff and I just met for breakfast a couple weeks ago before he went on vacation and I went on vacation. And as the new administrator, uh, Jeff is not new to Colerain Township. Jeff has been here for uh, quite a while, uh, has been um, involved, rolled up sleeves, and understands what's going on across the, the township. So when I say, Jeff, you're new, <laughs> you're, you're new to the helm, so to speak. Um, but um, as I was thinking about your strategic plan and the, the tweaking of the strategic plan, can you share uh, a little bit about what that means for 2023, uh, especially from a business perspective, and then share um, uh, just a little bit more uh, update on the two firehouses uh, in the township. So first off, I just wanna thank you all for being here. Um, when we talk strategic plan and, and as things move forward, it's not done in a vacuum. The township doesn't do all the work. In fact, a lot of the work is done because of all the different people in this room. So we've got you know, representatives from nonprofits and our local businesses and some of our, our larger businesses. And so just from me to all of you, I want to thank you all for being here and showing your support to the township that you've done over the years. As Dave mentioned, our strategic plan is tweaking a little bit for next year. We're going to place a, a bigger and heavier emphasis on critical assets and infrastructure. So what that means is it's kind of twofold for our organization. 
We're going to be out. We're going to be really focusing on looking at our streets, putting money into new roads, but also putting money into uh, two new fire stations. So our fire stations, 102 and 26, are both 50 to 60 years old. They come with a host of challenges. If you've ever been out to Station 102, I encourage you to do so within the next year. Um, we can barely close the bay doors. There's you know, maybe just a foot or so of gap between our apparatus. So getting it in is really, really tight. We're lucky that nobody's crashing uh, fire engines as they're backing in, but that's a part of our policies and procedures. Um, and then 26, which has been in Galbraith, uh, or off Galbraith Road here, a little west of where we are today, uh, it's been around for you know 50 to 60 years as well. It was one of the first fire stations in Colbane Township. It was started as volunteer fire station. Um, and it's seen better days, and it has well uh, been outgrown. It is our busiest station uh, in the whole township. And so we're super excited to be building two new fire stations next year that are going to be state of the art and allow us to hopefully revitalize a couple of areas of our community as well and where these are going to be you know, strategically situated. Um, Beyond that, when we think about our critical assets and infrastructure, we're also going to be, with the, state, uh, with the help of the state of Ohio, finishing out our Fort Colerain playground project. So, you guys remember uh, a few years ago, we got some money from the state. We were able to build this brand new Fort Dunlap, Fort Colerain. Uh, that's just so much fun to go out and watch the kids play. But then we always had this kind of eyesore down just the hill from it of the toddler playground, which we pulled out the rusted old playground equipment that's there. And now we're going to have this beautiful landscape that's going to connect the two. And it's going to be reminiscent of the trail that folks took way back in the day from Fort Washington down in Cincinnati out to Fort uh, Dunlap uh, when it was out in Colbrain Township. So these are kind of the first two outposts in, in this area. And so we really need to pay homage to that history. Um, and then when we also think about our strategic plan, one of the really big things that we're going to be focusing on in terms of our assets is our own people. So the people that we have on staff. We've never really paid a huge focus on succession planning, but if these past few years have told us anything in the, the private sector, we're seeing a transition. I mean, we're seeing people leave our organization just like you all are seeing people come in and out of your organizations. And so we want to make sure that if anybody is to leave our organization, we've got just a great rate of folks ready to step up, that have been trained, and that are you know, ready to take the helm so that we don't miss a beat, and so that none of you all miss a beat, because you all need us to be on our day game every day in order to be able to help you all in the same way that we need you all to come and help us. So it's a little bit of what we've got going on, which I'm super excited to dig my hands in and, and see happen next year. One of the things you mentioned was um, was hiring and staffing correctly. Everybody in the room knows that staffing is a challenge. Um, as one of the larger employers in the community, obviously with the school district and with Rumpke as uh, additional large employers, uh, share with us just briefly uh, some of the innovative things that you're doing and, and how you're addressing it uh, you know, feet on the street. So one of the big challenges that's going on countrywide is a lack of folks going into police and fire. And we're, we're not unique to that, so we've got that issue right now. Um, we're down staffing-wise in those departments, and that's a problem. And so we sat down recently at a leadership team meeting, and you know we all kind of bemoaned a little bit about just that a lot of people that don't get into the profession, and so on and so forth. And, and we looked at each other, and we challenged ourselves to say, well, you know, it's up to us to solve that problem. Right? We can't just sit back and say, well, everybody's dealing with it, so you know it'll either come around or it won't. And so some of the things we're actually doing is, is we're trying to leverage partnerships with folks that we got up here. So we recognize that if we want to be a community um, that is representative and, and our employees are representative of our community, we've got to be looking at our schools. And so we're trying to do some innovative things in terms of our fire department, where we've now got recruit classes that are going into the high schools and, and getting these folks before they graduate because these are good paying jobs too that you know sometimes people just don't realize uh, how much you make as a police or firefighter um, and and the value that you're able to give back to your community in which you live and i think that's the best way to get good employees is people who are from here that know this place that love this place and want to see the same change that we all want to see and so we're starting to do stuff in that realm we're uh, really digging in on the police side as well to Try to see how we might have a program the next year or two that would allow for students to kind of bridge the gap from high school to becoming an officer. Under state law, you're not allowed to become a police officer until you're 21. 
And so sometimes kids graduate from high school and they may or may not do something that will prevent them from being a police officer down the road. Well, if you can find a way to bridge that gap and get them into our organization or in our values and our culture, then maybe we're able to have a, a huge list of folks that are, are waiting to get hired on full time as police officers here. Or if they can't get hired on here, maybe they bounce somewhere else and then they just wait while they're working somewhere else until they're able to come back to full name. I find that uh, a lot of our officers, when we talk to them about why they're here and why they like working here, it's because they grew up here. And so they've got a deep sense of connection to our community and we wanna make sure that we continue to capitalize on that. And that's not gonna be possible without, without a great partner like you. Just a quick story. Uh, we had our fire and, appreciate, fire and police appreciation breakfast in uh, September, and we recognized several um, individuals who have done some pretty cool things across the, the community from a fire and police perspective. And uh, not as many people uh, were able to attend this year because they were actually out doing their work. And uh, because they were understaffed and overworked, uh, we didn't have as great of, have as good an attendance. So I get a phone call, uh, a phone call, uh, uh, one of the police officers uh, came up to me at an event and uh, said, by the way, did you know that the um, franchise owner for the two McDonald's have changed hands? I said, no, I, I didn't know that. And uh, he handed me a slip of paper with her uh, phone number on it and her name and said, give her a call, she might be interested in joining the chamber. He was advocating on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce uh, because he understands this connection between. Uh, he was on a call um, that uh, had to be taken care of and uh, uh, took the time and energy to uh, approach me about that. So I can't uh, thank the uh, three of you for uh, enough for the relationship that we have. Um, I have, um, I'm going to do, do something a little bit different. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, uh one of our number one sought after classes um, at Butler Tech is fire. And so the students are out there. So what we did last year for the first time is we did a senior only fire because we had so many students that got turned away their junior year. We figured they're still out there. They're just a senior now. So now we offer senior only. Um, they get their EMT in high school for that reason. And then we do Tuesday experience where students get to choose what they want to do on Fridays. They can also earn their EMT license that way. Um, so we do have the students coming out of there and the demand is huge, but we're a public school as well, just trying to find space and instructors to do that. Uh, but the demand is there. So we just gotta work together more because we do have those students coming out. We have about 25 more this year than we've ever had. Yeah. And the police program that I went to um, I think it's over 100 kids. Yeah. <laughs> in this, 100 kids in a room this size uh, with two instructors plus uh, adjunct people that are coming in. Yeah. Um, and they continue to grow. So, uh, again, thanks so much for that. Um, I'm going to turn this over to the audience. Uh, you guys all have questions, and uh, they're here to answer them for you. Um, I was going to say before I did that uh, that Cindy Abrams provided me an answer to uh, the questions that I had provided. Uh, as well. So if you're registered this morning, I'm going to send that email out to you rather than read that. Um, I'll, I'll send that out to everybody that's here and you'll see Cindy's responses. So Sounds great. what questions do you have? Rick. I have a question for Daryl. Um, I just get a sense from, from my kids' school that obviously with the pandemic, it was a difficult time for education, and I'm glad to hear that you had a good report card. Um, you know, do you have a sense that you know nationwide kids really didn't get a lot of education during that time, and what was it that allowed your kids to succeed in that environment? So it's very disparate. There, are, um, a lot of what happened during the pandemic when we shut down and kids were home was based on the support at home. We as a district have been very fortunate that we have a lot of partners that wrap around. So we have side by side, we have children's home, we have guidance counselors and social workers. And a lot of what we found was the need that was there um, addressing food insecurity through our food distribution really helped create some of that support network 
where kids were able to feel connected and supported um, and engaged. So some of our attendance rates when we were on Zoom, you know, having kids on there, a lot of times it was difficult because they had the ability to kind of turn the camera off, disengage. And a lot of the work that our staff did to maintain a personal engagement with the kids and the families, I think was one of the strategies that really worked well transitioning for us as a school because we value so much the relationship that those relationships were strong before the pandemic hit and helped guide us through the pandemic. I think the other thing is we really um, put a lot of time and effort into that recovery, making sure that as we got kids back into the building, we were able to really assess where they were and start to fill gaps. We are still doing that. Um, and so it's an ongoing progress, but I think we have a lot to be proud of as a district for being able to maintain connection and support to our kids and families, even when we were forced to go remote. And it may not have felt like we were prepared, but the relationships are the best we have. Chris, you got a question? Uh, yes. Since this is a business group, can Jeff Wecklock address the partnership or the way that the township is trying to support the business community, for example, with the new facade grant program? Yeah, so we've got a few different uh, projects that are going on, and most of them are being well <coughs> led by uh, David Miller, who's our economic development director in the room. If you want to give a wave to everybody. If you guys haven't met David, he's a good person to get to know. He's got whole list of different uh, contacts with Ready Jobs Ohio and other partners that do provide incentives and what have you if you're looking to expand or if you're thinking about leaving us as ways to impact you to stay. Um, but beyond that, Chris brings up a great point. So we've got some new programs that we'll be launching next year. One is the Facade Improvement Program. This is really intended to provide a, a matching grant to different businesses throughout our community to allow them to provide a facelift to their front door. So we understand that in order to have a great looking business corridor, we got to have great looking fronts to our businesses. And so, you know, maybe you've got a sign that's 30 or 40 years old and, and needs to be replaced and modernized. Well, this would be an opportunity for us to provide a, a matching grant to you all dollar for dollar for the improvements that you're going to make and the investment that you're going to make in, our, in your business. Um, some other projects that are in our economic development world that we're going to be working on are business improvement districts. So we recognize that there are certain areas, specifically on the Colerain Corridor, where we've got like-minded businesses that are doing similar types of work, that if they were to come together and coalesce and form their own sort of business improvement district, they could take a greater ownership in what their front door looks like as an entire district. And so that may be gateway signage. Uh, that may be, you know, finding somebody who's going to put in some lovely planters up and down the corridor and pay for those to be watered and maintained. So those are a couple of things that we've got going on. Um, we're always out looking at sites. We're always out making connections with developers in order to try to better uh, improve our, our different facets of the township. So we've got a great small industrial corridor at the south end of Colbrain. We've got a new industrial park coming online uh, just off of Generation Drive where Rumpy is. And then we've got just a whole slew of other opportunities in the community. And we're, we're out there constantly shaking bushes and trees trying to see if we can shake out the right right things for the township. And a shameless plug for uh, this coming Saturday, for those uh, who don't know, the township and the fire department and people working cooperatively have come together to uh, make our community a better place to live, work, and play through the Colerain Give Back Day. Um, over 250 volunteers, I believe, so have signed up already. Um, if your business wants to support that, uh, see me, see Jeff, see um, uh, David Denny in the room. Uh, but it's an opportunity for us to uh, clean up the community and make it uh, more visibly clean uh, in the community. And our Team Up to Green Up initiative has been amazingly well supported. So thank you. Thank you for that. Um, there are a couple of other questions in the back. Uh, John. Uh, you mentioned uh, new fire fire stations. What? Which one is 106 you mentioned? So 102 is the one that's currently on uh, Old Cole Rain at Kemper. Yeah, okay. And then 26 is the one down off of Calvary. So these two are going to be totally replaced? Yes. Okay. Re replaced at new locations. And where are these new locations? So the one is going to be on Generation Drive. So we've got a three-acre parcel there that, that has been granted to us. Um, the other one is also going to be on Galbraith, uh, but the location hasn't been yet completely finalized yet. Okay. 
Um, we ran models and, and we're actually pretty excited with these two shifts. Uh, we're gonna see a 450% uh, decrease in response times uh, just because of where they're going to be now located, which is really an incredible thing for our community to be able to get to them as quickly as possible. Especially when you think of some things like uh, heart attacks where every second matters. Uh, being able to get there that much faster is also going to do a lot more lives safe in the long run. If, if I may, my dad was a charter member of Dunlap Volunteer Fire Department okay. back in, way back in the 50s. And I think he would be very proud of what's going on with our uh, response team <clears throat> from the fire and everything. It's just, I think it's outstanding what's happening here. So yes. thank you. Yep, thank you for that. In the back. Yeah. Uh, I hear, you know, read some stories about uh, teachers dropping out of the profession. And I was just wondering, are you having any issues with that or attracting new teachers? And if so, you know, what, what types of things are you doing? So we have seen turnover. Um, we are fully staffed with our teaching right now. We have done some stay interviews with some of our employees who are newly hired but have stayed in the first couple of years. And we've done some interviews with some of our more senior staff to kind of do the same thing that Jeff did with the firefighters. Like, why, are, why do you stay and why Northwest? And a lot of it has been around the mission, the vision, the the belief around making a difference and feeling like here they are able to make a difference. And so um, we've been really strategic about trying to make sure that we support some of our new hires in that process of kind of acclimating to our community because we are seeing people who are transitioning jobs and we have people who are coming here from outside of the state. And so being able to help them acclimate to not just Northwest, but to the entire community um, has been a a strategy for us. We still do have and are still looking for open positions with some of our um, non-licensed staff, so some of our classroom assistants and bus drivers. And so we've been trying to really do some pop-up hiring events, some local things where we're really pulling from the local community to support the schools and find people that way. So um, from a from the teacher level, yeah, we're still we've seen turnover, but we have seen enough people interested in coming. But from our um, bus drivers and some are not licensed staff. We're still looking for some local people who are interested in being a part of our mission to support kids and change lives. There continues to be a need for uh, substitute teachers, correct? Yeah, and the state has made it easier to be a substitute teacher. So um, basically, um, anyone with a high school diploma can go through the process of becoming a sub. So being able to kind of backfill this having enough people to fill the vacancies when our staff are out for leave, for FMLA, for sick time, um, and being able to backfill that so that our operation continues to move seamlessly can be a difficult thing. So um, anyone who's interested in being a sub can do that as long as you have that high school diploma and you can kind of jump through a couple of extra hoops with the background checks, but um, we're always looking for subs as well. Susan? Oh, no, go ahead. I was just going to say, too, um, sometimes you might not think that um, you would have something to give to that when you guys mentioned about retention in teachers. Hug a teacher. <laughs> the last couple of years has been really hard for them. Um, when you're sitting in a Zoom like that, you have to be an entertainer. Um, they've had to do a lot of things they, they weren't prepared for. But to Daryl's point, if, if you have time, even an hour a week, um, it's really helpful that a teacher feels valued. They know the community wants to help out. Like I was saying with the Career Connect, if, if you want to become a business partner, all that might mean is you spend time um, in the schools, or if you have leftover material, the schools can use that. Just as a community, when you're a teacher and you feel as though the businesses as well just really care if you're okay, um, that's really important too. It's not about the money, uh, always it's just about the care and the, hey, do you need some help or could you use an hour? That That's that's really caring and it keeps people retained. And the business of, have, in our area have been phenomenal supporting our schools and our staff. In fact, Dave kind of came to the rescue with the business community last spring when subbing was a huge issue in our buildings and our staff, when we don't have enough subs, they cover on their phone bill. If they're an elementary teacher, they just divide the kids up and every teacher gets like four or five extra kids that day. 
And so Dave worked with the business community and did raffles for our staff who had to do that a lot last year just to say thank you. And that business um, partnership to show that appreciation to our staff has been greatly appreciated. So Daryl, could you speak a little bit about the portrait of a graduate? Absolutely. So um, we've done a couple of things over the last um, four years to really kind of engage the community about what they want from the school. One was developing our strategic plan and the other was the portrait of a graduate. The portrait of a graduate is really looking beyond the state curriculum around reading, writing, and arithmetic to the skills and competencies that the community really values in a graduate. And so we spent time engaging with businesses and community members and parents and kids to talk about what do you need when you leave us to be the most employable for your next step, whether that's enlistment, employment, or enrollment, we wanna make sure you're prepared. And so there were six competencies that really came out. So communication, collaboration, <coughs> empathy, learner's mindset, integrity, adaptability. And so those six qualities are embedded starting in preschool through 12th grade to make sure that as our students are learning content, they're also doing so in a way that helps them problem solve, collaborate with other people, and have the skills that you're looking for as a business when they leave us with not just a degree, but with the skills to be a good employee. Um, in the interest of time, uh, we'll take two more questions and then um, uh, we'll wrap it up. Ned? Um, I just was wondering if the, at the last, at a recent trustees meeting, they presented some pretty stark statistics about pay for police and fire, which definitely, you know, I know we all work for passion and not for money, but at the same time, <laughs> you do, people do move for, to get better pay. How is Northwest, I know in the past we've struggled to pay competitively to other school districts. How is that looking for us? So we still are about the middle of the pack in terms of when you look at um, the region from an educational standpoint. And so we do have some people who will jump from one district to another. When we do exit interviews, um, sometimes pay is one of the things that we find um, when people leave us from an exit interview perspective. It's around um, either relocation or they're looking for a different opportunity and pay can be part of it. Um, so we, we have a partnership with the community where we're trying to keep our operation within 3% growth every year, but we also have, uh, our funding is about, right now it's 40% from the state, but the state just recalculated based on the re most recent census and said that we're a wealthier district <coughs> and they're gonna reduce the state funding to 25% versus 40 um, and put more on the community to pick up that cost. So. Because of our funding, we kind of stay middle of the pack. Um, we really try to sell ourselves based <coughs> on the community we have, the relationships we have, and the fact that being part of the Northwest system and being part of a family, and not just with our district, but with our community. And so we have a lot of people who stay because of the passion, in spite of the money, because of the work that we're doing and the passion they feel from you toward the schools and the support they feel from the entire community. Do you have a statistic on uh, how many actually teachers live in the district you know, or uh, had gone through, uh, lived in the district as a kid? We, I don't have the actual statistic. Um, we do have as a staff, um, a lot of people who are connected to the community, either by living here or knowing someone here or graduating from here. Um, so we do have a lot of homegrown talent that we are trying to capitalize on. And like I said, we're trying to do some of our local hiring events but we want to really pull from the community and have people who are with us and connected with us for the right reason. We also have some strategies in place to fill that teacher pipeline um, with being able to kind of recruit from within. So any of our non-licensed staff who are interested in becoming teaching staff, we have partnerships with different universities where they can get a discounted rate. We do tuition reimbursement for our non-licensed staff to be able to become a teacher. And we offer them a sabbatical leave while they do the student teaching. So they still can maintain an appointment after the student teaching while they continue to find a job with us. So we're putting some strategies in place to try to grow our own as well as that recruitment piece. One last question. If nobody else wants it, I'll ask it. <laughs> Something that's concerning to me in the world in general is COVID appears to have convinced everybody that they can 
don't have to come in anymore to work. Um, and it appears, from based on some reporting recently, that this is really happening in schools. I was pretty shocked at Cincinnati Public's attendance rate and Ohio's in general. And I'm sure that it's because their parents are at home, you know, and people, it's just shocking to imagine 50%, like taking CPS, you know, chronic absenteeism. What are you guys doing about absenteeism? And I have this fear that 10 and 15 and 20 years from now, they'll have grown up thinking you don't actually have to show up to your job, to school, to life. Um, so our chronic absenteeism rate as a district was almost 40% last year, but again, that was based on last year's data and all of the quarantines contribute to that number. Um, so we do have an attendance policy. We do require all kids and staff to be on site every day. Obviously it's a relationship and build that in person. Um, we have a lot of strategies around our attendance. Um, in the state, there's a legislation that came through House Bill 410 that mandates certain trigger points for different kinds of consequences for absenteeism. We have a partnership with the Hamlin County um, Juvenile Court System. And so we're actually at the township um, in their trustee chambers every Thursday with our own version of a diversionary court system for kids and parents who are experiencing truancy issues. And we have a magistrate from the court who meets with our families. We have our enrollment supervisor, our student services director, our social worker there, our principal shows up. And when families are experiencing different truancy issues, we problem solve with the court system around that. And we appreciate the partnership with the township to give us the space to do that and put strategies in place to monitor that. So we are seeing higher absentee rates, but we are putting strategies in place from the building level um, to monitor that, intervene as early as possible, and try to get kids back on track. And I want to say, too, we all show up to places we feel valued, we feel safe, we feel cared about. And even hearing Daryl talk um, so eloquently about um, needing money and the bond, it's, it's one of those things when you are able to focus on building out or building new, you can say, how can we keep our spaces safer as well? When you're building out new, I was an administrator in Princeton for eight years. We were able to build and put in some structures to keep us safe physically as well when, when things don't go well. So I know they're looking into that and everyone feeling safe and feeling a part of it. Um, but kids feel that when they come into a space and they know that their community is voting yes and they are taking care of them. They feel that when they get into a building and that is what will increase everyone's morale um, to know that school is a safe, loving, caring place where not only we learn, but we have a family. Um, so it's so important that we have these meetings and talk about the value of the school district and they're all leading that um, as we move on. And from a practical perspective, we as employers have the opportunity to give back to the community, to the schools. Um, uh, I've been talking with uh, Gail and Dale about this particular program with the, with the court system. You as an employer can uh, uh, stop in and become a mentor. Uh, you can support the family that's going through a specific challenge, uh, whether that's gun violence or um, a specific struggle at, the, at their home that has caused this, uh, this issue. And we as a business community need to do more and to give back more. Uh, but as I've said to all of you at one point or another, uh, we're all busy in our own businesses, right? Uh, we, we don't have time for strategic planning of our own because we're working in our business because we're struggling with uh, finding staff and we're struggling to uh, keep those doors open. And uh, so uh, again, the fact that you're here this morning as leaders in the business community, I really appreciate that. I'm sure that they do as well. Um, again, we um, have an opportunity to go out into the community and uh, make a difference. If you can support Saturday's uh, Coloring Give Back Day, please do so. Uh, if you can support the Team Up to Green Up.org initiative by picking up and uh, removing garbage and signing up for an adopt a block uh, program or giving to the tree program. Uh, that would be terrific. And if you can increase your uh, commercial recycling and keep uh, less from going into the landfill uh, on North Pole Rain, that will make a difference in our community. So uh, on behalf of uh, the three speakers we have and Cindy Abrams, who was not able to be here, thank you so much. Yeah.